Welcome! In this video, I will try to shed some light on my favorite feathering techniques and try to explain the reasoning and considerations behind them. The goal here is to present you with potential new ideas that you can then adopt, or not, into your own workflow. This is my first hobby video, so bear with me, and any feedback is much appreciated. All the techniques are totally applicable to your normal minis as well, but I'm just demonstrating them on this terrain piece. Using them all together like this is not quick, so speed painters beware. Although none of the individual techniques are particularly slow either, so there might be something here even the less patient could use to spice up their terrain. As a starting point, I have a base coated shaded and dry brushed piece of 440k terrain with a grayish uh, denim like blue and mustard yellow as the main colors. Blue and yellow go usually well together and both will work with the rust colors that I have planned to use in the weathering phase. And note that I have also applied all my decals for some extra flavor at this point. The first thing I would recommend for gaming or kind of grim dark style terrain is to avoid fully saturated bright colors and opt for muted tones instead. Uh, bright colors might look striking, but then again they can also overwhelm any mini standing on such terrain and they don't quite get that grim dark feel through. And in, if you look around in current urban areas, uh, you don't usually see many brightly colored buildings either. And of course there are ways to bring the colors down a notch later, uh, with washes for example, but think about your color picks before you start. Before I started recording, I had already stippled some texture on the blue-gray part with the makeup brush, pretty much as an experiment. You may have noticed the effect in the close-up images scrolling the background, uh, but this is why I'm not working on the blue part much in the video. It's already done, but maybe that's a topic for another video. But now, let's mess it all up. Sponge stippling is a simple, fast and popular technique and I used a lot. Uh, it's nothing new at this point, most of you have probably heard about it. Uh, but it's an additive technique versus subtractive, so you're adding on paint. Uh, instead of subtractive, where you are removing paint to get the chipping done. Uh, something that would be subtractive would be stuff like chipping mediums. Uh, you can probably get more realistic results with uh, using the chipping mediums, but you are also putting in much more effort into it. That's why I generally prefer plain sponge stippling. You can use almost any kind of sponge. Packaging material, washing sponges, whatever. Uh, I think I use a piece of both in this video. So before you start, tear the sponge up a bit, the more irregular shape, the better, and go to town. You should pick your chipping colors based on your main colors. Uh, this is one part where I will sacrifice realism for the sake of visual interest and contrast. Rust isn't uniform, so you can use many different shades of rust to create variance. You can go from near black brown through orange to near yellow, but there is more to it. Let's say you have red chipping container. Uh, consider making your rust chipping very dark brown or near black because reddish brown on red isn't just very striking. Also, instead of rust, you could just have the imaginary primer to be exposed under the surface paint. But to be honest, you need to kind of put in the effort to sell the effect. I use plain metal chipping very sparingly, but there is of course a place for that too, especially if there is a good in-universe reason for it, like a blade's edge or tank track, something that gets regular wear and rust doesn't really have time to set in. For this project I'm starting with burnt umber as my dark rust color and burnt sienna as my lighter slightly orange rust. Uh, if I feel like it, I can mix the two tones and get a good variation of color, depending on what I want to achieve. And note that these paints in question are actually artists' acrylics, but the type of paint isn't really a factor here. I tend to use these especially for terrain because they are A. Good rust tones, and B. They are cheap as hell compared to regular miniature paints. And sponge stippling especially is a very wasteful technique and uses a lot of paint. To create more visual interest, you can add light scratches and paint damage by stippling on a lighter color. Uh, if a paint job is damaged only lightly, the paint is not removed completely and the metal or primer underneath is not exposed to the elements. This color doesn't need to be very contrasting and in most cases just adding a little white to your base tone gets you a good color for this. 
to get a somewhat realistic look, you need to be quite conscious about the placement and amount of chipping you are applying. It's easy to get carried away or have your random placement not to be random at all. As human brain tends to favor order over chaos, uh, try to work against your brain and try to be random and chaotic. Uh, it's of course hard to give exact instruction on how to achieve this, but as you stipple, there are a couple of things that you should consider. 1. Keep adjusting the amount of paint in the sponge. Less paint, smaller chips, and more paint, stronger chips. You can dab the excess off. 2. Keep adjusting the pressure. Less pressure, more spread out and smaller the individual chips will be, and with more pressure you can apply a big area of rust at once. 3. Keep adjusting the rotation of the sponge and use different parts of it to stipple to avoid uniform patterns forming. And 4. If you have decals, consider adding some chipping on top. It ties the decal to the piece and gives it more of a painted on look. If you constantly keep adjusting these different parameters while stippling, your chipping is going to look much more natural. You want to have tiny chips, big areas of rust and everything in between, but try to practice some self-moderation and also keep some clean surface visible, or it will soon start to look pretty weird. To add more variation, I'm applying some brush techniques as well. Scratches and irregular edge highlights are great for that, and I'm also fine-tuning some of the sponge work that I did earlier. But as a general rule, vary your scratch thickness, length and placement, because it looks super weird when all the scratches are near uniform or placed symmetrically. Remember that in most cases less is more. And for more contrast, you can add a highlight below the rust scratches to signify a deeper cut or just to boost the contrast. Streaking adds a nice realistic touch to any terrain. It's a fair assumption that when things are left outside, they get rain on them. And over time, that rain will then take all the dirt and rust with it as it flows down the structure and creates streaks. With the fantastic enamel products we have today, streaking effects are actually pretty fast to implement. Uh, I happen to have the streaking set from AK Interactive, which has three colors. Uh, rust streaks, streaking grime and winter streaking grime. And those roughly are equivalent to red brown, green brown and green. The idea is to first apply a strong streak running down a surface and then let it dry a bit. Once it's dried for some minutes, you then come back with a soft clean brush with the tiniest amount of white spirits and start brushing the streak in a downward motion. After a little brushing, the white spirit will reactivate the enamel and the brush will start to pick up some of the paint and drag it down with the motion, creating a realistic streaking effect. Uh, for larger surfaces like this piece, I have found a fast way of creating some subtle streaks along with these more visible streaks, but more on that later. It's very easy to remove the enamel completely if you use too much white spirits, so go easy. And don't apply unnecessary pressure with the brush or you could, uh, at least theoretically, risk damaging the acrylic paint underneath. And note also that it's not necessary to varnish before applying enamels or white spirits, but it doesn't hurt either, so whatever works for you. I like to use this streaking stuff also as an additional rust effect to add this uh, rusty tone around chipped areas or crevices, so that's why you can see me applying it rather liberally at places. I usually only wait around 5 minutes for the wash to dry, as I am impatient, but on the bottle I think they say to wait like 15 minutes or something. One thing I have noticed is that at least if I have very matte surface, these enamel wash products do actually stick on pretty tight after an hour or so. So, do consider that before leaving this stuff sitting on your project overnight. And once I have applied the wash and let it dry a bit, uh, it's time to get creative. I find this pretty challenging to put into words, but I'll try. As for the actual streaking effect, I dip a big brush into white spirits, wipe most of it off, and I really mean most of it, leaving just a minimal amount, and start making downward brushing motions on the streaks that I have applied earlier. Uh, I would recommend a coarse, big brush, and now that I think of it, an old flat dry brush could work pretty well. If properly dry, the paint doesn't come off on your first stroke, so just keep working until you see some of the paint moving with the brush. Uh, very soon after that, it's time to start working the whole surface in a similar fashion. At that point, some of the enamel has stuck to the brush, and you can then use that to create more subtle micro streaking across the whole surface. 
Direction of your brush strokes is very important, so only do downward motions and you shouldn't have to apply too much pressure. You are trying to essentially simulate water flowing across the surface. If you want more noticeable streaking, you can add tiny spots of enamel here and there to act as starting points for new streaks, uh, like in corners, rusted areas, scratches and such. Those don't need to be totally dry before you continue working, and you could consider them as a fuel for your brushwork. It may be obvious, but don't clean your brush if you want to keep making these micro streaks. However, if you take perhaps a smaller brush loaded with white spirits, you can use that to increase the streak definition in select places, or to create areas totally free of streaking for added visual interest. So in the end, you will have your stronger streaks and also these subtle micro streaks. A nice weather beaten look. For the larger areas with enamel wash, I dip a brush in white spirits, wipe most of it off once again, and start to stipple and push the paint around. I focus on the edges of the splotches, trying to make them natural looking by making these interesting irregular shapes with both sharp and smooth edges here and there, and I also may use something like my finger in some places to wipe some of the paint off. At some places I might load the brush up with plenty of white spirits and wash almost all the enamel off to get it to flow into crevices, but still leaving this slight rust filter on the flat surface. Uh, you can still then keep dabbing around the model with the same brush and it will carry some of that rust color with it, creating these more uh, subtle rust colored spots here and there. Point being, be messy, random and vary the tools and amount of white spirits you are applying, but be careful not to wash everything off. Oh, and you probably want to use nitrile gloves. Fun fact, latex gloves start to break down pretty fast when exposed to white spirits, as happened to me with this project. In any case, uh, I, don't, I don't think white spirits is a good skincare product. Here I'm just blocking in the small areas of color after working through the main parts. Dark red color for the little tanks, etc. and off-white for the tiny gauges and skulls. Red, yellow and blue form a triadic color scheme and also the red helps to establish small points of interest around the model. What color works with what is a bit out of scope for this video, but try to keep your overall palette limited or your terrain piece might start to look a bit too busy. I also add quick shading and highlights, and I make sure I have all the matte details and also apply a quick black brown uh, and pink chipping to the red tanks, just like I did with the blue and yellow earlier. Then it's time to varnish everything. I exclusively use AK's Ultra Matte Varnish for my minis. That's the real stuff gives absolutely all shine, but it can also be a double-edged sword because it will also destroy that nice metallic sheen in your metal parts. That's why I tend to paint metallics only after I'm finished with the matte colors. The difference in finish between matte colors and shining metals gives you yet another layer of contrast, so that's something to consider. I blocked in all the metals at once. Steel for the trim and small details, and copper for some of the pipe work. Steel, or basically grey, is a neutral color and doesn't really mess with the color composition of the piece. Uh, and copper as a reddish tone jumps out nicely against the blue. After I was done with the steel, I just dry brushed on a quick highlight with silver. I wish Vallejo would pay me for this, but really, their medical range is the shit. I have yet to come across any other acrylic metallics that would surpass them when it comes to actual metallic sheen, fluidity and opacity. Admittedly, the range is very limited in terms of non-steel or silver colors, as there are only two, gold and copper. But you can mix them together for different golds, but then if you want more tones than that, you will have to bring in inks to the mix. I wanted to weather the copper parts at this point, because I'm using purely water-based paints for it, and the cleaning process for the oil wash later uh, doesn't interfere with these paints. Old copper roofs and statues are usually nearly totally oxidized unless they are brand new. Uh, think of the Statue of Liberty, that's copper. So in this case I'll use my artistic license and only create spots of oxidization. Uh, and I will also make it muted so that the copper parts sit better with the rest of the piece. Bright blue greens and turquoises work well as oxidized copper. I pick three suitable paints and then lightly stippled them on all the copper parts in a random fashion. You will still want to leave some of the copper showing, of course. At places, I thin the paint down to a wash consistency and apply that on a wider area, where it will pool in the corners and crevices. To bring the bright colors back in line, I apply a simple wash of Agrax Earth Shade to all the copper parts. It shades the recesses, improves contrast, 
reduces the reflectiveness of the metal and mutes everything down. The last step is to go back to the copper color again and lightly, and I mean lightly, stipple it here and there, avoiding shadows and focusing on the raised surfaces. You can also take a smaller brush and pick out some of the edges with highlights. Just don't go overboard, you don't want to erase all your previous work. Oil washes are a great way to create shading in the recesses and give your piece an overall dark filter that ties the underlying colors together. It's fast, it's messy and it can produce great results. Uh, in most cases you want to use a dark color, black or dark brown, but the wash can really be any color, just like with the acrylic washes. Concept is, uh, you apply the wash, either targeted all, all over, and then let it sit for a while, then wipe the excess off, and that leaves some of the wash still in the crevices and shadowed areas. To create an oil wash, you will need some white spirits and oil paints. You mix a dab of oil paint with the white spirits to create the wash, and the ratio, as with everything, uh, depends, but the thicker your mixture is, the more it will tint the paint job and leave stronger shadows. If you don't have any clue, start with something like 1 to 4 ratio of oil paint to white spirits and go from there. And another, perhaps more important factor that determines how much the wash tints the colors below is the time you let it sit. I used a thin mix as I wanted to preserve most of the colors and I already have some recess shading from the initial noon oil wash. Uh, I applied the oil wash all over and started removing it almost right after with a clean makeup sponge. Uh, preferring downward motions, I used the sponge to remove the excess oils from the flat areas and top surfaces. Once most of the oil wash was removed, I dipped the makeup sponge into white spirits, making it an eraser, essentially. I went over the flat and top surfaces again, removing nearly all of the oil wash from the areas I wanted to stay relatively bright. The excess white spirits from the sponge flow to the corners and take some of the oils with them, darkening the shadows further. I noticed that I had lost some of the shading between the panels in the process, so I carefully applied the wash into the panel lines again, avoiding the flat surfaces. As a last step, I removed almost all of the white spirits from the sponge and went over the model one more time to bring out some more highlights. Using gentle downward strokes, I removed some more oil wash from the edges that were still a bit too dark for my taste. Because I'm apparently not very bright, I didn't notice I wasn't recording when I wet the steel, so apologies for that. Live and learn. But that's why I'm filling this space with more oil wash footage while I talk about weathering the steel. Luckily, the process is almost identical to how I describe using the enamel washes on the blue and yellow parts. Same techniques and considerations apply, it's just more targeted on the steel parts. Apply the enamel wash thickly for areas you want to be totally rusted out, and less so in areas where you just want some slight rust coloration. And once you are done, let it dry well, as now we want some of the paint to actually stick a bit better. Around 10 minutes should do the trick. Once the wash is dry, come back with a coarse, stiff brush, perhaps like a small round dry brush, and use stippling motions to get irregular edges and shapes on the rust areas. Pick some places where you will saturate the whole area with white spirits and spread the enamel around more like a wash. Uh, and you can also often use your finger just to wipe the enamel off of raised areas like rivets, uh, but be careful not to apply too much pressure or you may risk removing too much. If you want something to look dusty, pigment powders are your friend. They come in many colors, like for example, rust, of course, <laughs> and they are easy to apply with a brush. Many of you are probably familiar with pigment powders and how to use them, but what may be less common knowledge is that you can create uh, these kind of washes with them. I wanted the top of the chimney to have a sooty look, and I applied straight black pigment to the top end. First application did give me a dark enough finish, so I used isopropyl alcohol to bind the first layer of pigment in place. Unfortunately, you can't just keep throwing more and more pigment powder on top of something and make the color stronger that way. No, at that point you are just pushing the powder around, so you want to bind the first layer before applying more. But anyway, after the second coat of pigment, the chimney looked good and I left it at that. So, on to pigment washes, or I don't really know what else to call them. Uh, you mix up a small amount of dry pigment to white spirits, and there you have it. The stronger wash you want, the more pigment you need, uh, and they behave a lot like an oil wash, as the main component, of course, white spirits, is the same. White spirits has a very low surface tension, so it also flows really well, 
you just need to dab your brush against the corner or the panel line and the wash basically shoots off the brush cleanly along the line, leaving the flat surfaces clean. And the wash dries obviously super matte because at that point it's just deposited pigment. There is no real binder like acrylic medium for example in this stuff, so you can reactivate the pigment at any time to make adjustments if you need to. That's probably partially why you also want to keep mixing the wash often because otherwise the pigment will just slowly fall down to the bottom of your container over time. I use these pigment washes to create brighter orange rust deposits where I wanted small spots of color for visual interest. Uh, but once again, key to a good result is moderation, so don't go all in on this. Less is more, once again. Painting good looking gaming terrain is a balancing act between realism and artistic impression. If you like a more realistic approach, look at reference pictures. Actual, rusted out industrial facilities, war-torn cities, etc. But don't be afraid to add your own twist wherever you think it looks cool. After all, the 41st millennium does give you some headroom for adjustment. Thank you so much for watching. If you watched all the way through, you're a true champion. Uh, like the video if you liked it, and let me know what you thought of it in the comments. I think I will make more videos, so... Please also tell me if there is any particular subject you would like me to address in the future. Very special thank you to Mr. Sebastian Kling, who offered to produce this background music track just for me. He has also produced awesome music for the Midwinter Minis channel, so please, go check his stuff out. You can find a link to Sebastian's YouTube channel and to my Instagram profile in the description. Goodbye, and may the Emperor be with you.